Right, it is 10 past 11 and we are going to resume. So we are just on item number six and we are just, I'm just going to move the recommendations and then we'll go into comment. So I have a second of thank you, Councillor Barrett. So I will just read out the recommendations. Are we back to recording? Are we actually recording this on YouTube? Recording the sound. Okay, okay, that's fine. So we still um, haven't got our pictures, but that's coming. So I just will read out the recommendations for those on uh, line. And recommendation one is that the committee receive the memorandum titled Quarterly Performance and Financial Report Quarter ending 30th of June 2022 presented to the Finance and Audit Committee on 24th of August 2022. Number two, that council note per the details of attachment four of this report, A, that the BUD capital expenditure carry, carry forward values in the 22-23 annual budget will be increased by 7.387 million. B, that associated capital revenue will be increased by 187K. C, operational expenditure will be decreased by 130K. D, that carry forwards totaling 2.335 million previously sig signalled in the annual budget 22-23 are uh, deferred to 23-24 financial year. And item number three, that the chief executive be given delegation to allocate 100% of funds from the 188 from Program 1888 Low Carbon Fund to other activities, as well as moving the fund between capital new and capital renewal for the financial year 22-23. Right, that's a mouthful, so we will continue. Um, now, I'm happy to support these recommendations. Um, I won't go on too long, but my main concern has always been the forecasting of the capital new and renewals. Um, I am pleased to hear um, from Cathy that we now have the right people and the right processes in place. So I hope coming into the new millennium that we'll have far better reporting around our referrals and our forecasting and our carry forward. So I'm not going to go on too much um, about this, but um, I'd just like to thank all the staff for preparing the report. And um, the end of the year, it is what it is. It's been a real tough year. And I'm actually very pleased with the result that we've got, we've had compared, to, especially compared to a lot of a lot of other councils. So I would just like to thank all the staff and their hard work and to be able to achieve the the results that we have. And I cannot not comment about the 28 new houses that we've now our little units at Papi Old Place. So I'm um, it's great to end the financial year to know that we've been able to provide some um, additional social housing for um, people that, re you know, are vulnerable people. So I'd like to thank the staff. Um, so next in line is Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to make some uh, general comments, I suppose. And the first one is just to acknowledge that it has not been a normal year by any uh, stretch of the imagination and that it's been very difficult uh, to predict from quarter to quarter, uh, sort of what new challenge might pop up. Um, and yet, despite that, there's been some good achievements. And I think it, you know, it would be, uh, it would be remiss of us not to acknowledge the huge pressure that um, people have been working under this year, particularly in terms of uh, illness, but also, you know, challenges in terms of vacancies in the organisation, challenges in terms of, um, supply chain and, and contractor availability. Um, you know, it's been a very difficult year. And uh, yet, uh, when we look at the result, um, you know, a lot has been achieved. And I think, um, you know, it's important that we acknowledge that 
the effort, the fact that I know that many staff have gone above and beyond in the course of the year, uh, you know, coming back when they perhaps haven't been 100% well and um, working on uh, doing extra work to cover for people who are off sick. So just like to acknowledge that. Um, and I do um, note that we're still carrying a high level of vacancies and it is a concern because it puts everybody else under pressure. Um, so if you're carrying... 100 plus vacancies, we won't be precise about the figure just at the moment, um, out of a staff of uh, 650, 660. That's a significant level of vacancies and it puts everybody else under pressure. And that's without all of the other issues and challenges that have been coming up. So um, I do hope that we'll be able to see um, some progress in getting the number of vacancies reduced over the course of the year. But, you know, all in all, um, I think uh, we've done pretty well and um, acknowledge the huge effort that staff have put in to be able to achieve what we have achieved. Thank you. Mr Armstrong. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have a couple of comments to make. Firstly, I uh, certainly support uh, the comments around the effort this year and the challenges that we face and the way the organisations come through. Reflecting um, <clears throat> on the discussion today, um, look, we're looking at achieving a capital spend that we probably haven't ever before achieved in total. Um, we're operating with 106 vacancies or close to it. Um, we've had some quite significant changes in the management team. Uh, and also, um, we've got some pretty important projects uh, around our future, particularly in the IT space. Um, so I've heard nothing today from the management team that gives me cause for concern. In fact, and echoing your words, uh, Chris, ruthless prioritisation, um, I certainly support that because I think that with everything that's going on, the number of vacancies and what you're trying to achieve, there are actually some risks to execution. So I certainly support toll gating, the ruthless prioritisation, and I accept in the nature of, of this organisation that needs to be canvassed for shareholders, but I think that's a real challenge over the next 12 months, and I think you're on the right track in terms of being ruthless around that prioritisation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor Barrett. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, to open do want to acknowledge and appreciate um, the entire team in terms of all the projects that were brought across the line um, over the last 12 months in in very challenging circumstances. And um, Cam, your list at, at the um, opening comment, you know, really um, put an exclamation point on that in terms of what has been achieved in a very tough year. So a lot of um, appreciation to that whole team that's um, worked hard to make that happen. There's three areas that I did want to um, specifically highlight um, in this report. There is a lot in it and, and you could go a lot of different directions, but just three um, that I wanted to touch on. Um, the first is around the emerging evidence uh, from the resident survey and, and um, needing to really um, grapple with that. I think as, a, as an organization and as a community, it may well be that these um, downward trends around satisfaction, trust, et cetera, are widespread. Um, that doesn't change the fact that for this community, we need to lean into solving that and, and doing what we can um, to rebuild and restore um, in that space. So very much appreciate the um, assurance from the um, chief executive that that will be um, forthcoming once that result, um, once that survey is complete and the team has had a chance to contemplate it. The second area is just around the Ashurst shared path, um, a project long, long, long in the making and very near and dear um, to the heart of many in the community. And the reason that I do raise it and that I did ask questions around it is that we're now nearing the two year anniversary of, of when direction was given to get on with it and use um, legal means if needed. And that, of course, was direction given on the 10 year anniversary of the first petition. So this has had widespread interest from the community a long time. And the sooner we as a council can be at a point 
of giving some visibility to the community around that process um, and understanding the path forward there, no pun intended, would be um, very helpful for the broader community. So I wish staff well in their um, pursuit of that. The final area I'd like to comment on um, is kind of one that does come around every 12 months with, with the um, key performance indicators, et cetera, which is around our road safety record. And unfortunately, again, we're in a year where um, the number of deaths and serious injuries has gone up and significantly to 43, including five fatalities on our local roads. And that, um, to my mind, is too high a cost still. And, and I'm um, very keen that we continue um, to apply a stronger road safety lens to our transport planning um, and delivery of transport um, infrastructure improvements and services in the city. We need um, to have far less damage coming to people's lives on our roads and I'm very keen that we um, keep that as a priority and center in our decision making as well. But overall, um, again, a huge note of appreciation to the team for a huge amount of work done um, over the 12 months and look forward um, to the year ahead, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Um, I also concur with comments that others have made just in terms of the efforts that have been um, efforts by staff over this year and acknowledge the huge challenges in the environment that, um, that you know, uh, what what has been achieved in the in the last year, considering the challenges, is to be commended. Um, sadly, I think many of those challenges will still continue into the current year, and I think we need to acknowledge um, that you know things aren't just going to change overnight. Um, and so we do need to look at how we adapt um, going forward to our planning to accommodate that. Um, just in reflection of the delivery of the capital program being obviously well under what was budgeted, and that's obviously understandable in the current environment. But in reflecting on that, as, as indicated in my questions, what it, what's really evident is that um, elected members don't have a, an appropriate mechanism at this point to give direction within an annual budget year um, if there are to be certain programs prioritised over other programs. And as an example of a $72 million capital new program, we delivered $21 million of that. And none of us really got to say which programs we thought should be in the $51 million that weren't delivered versus the $21 that were delivered. And um, that is something that I think we need to think carefully about how we adapt throughout the year to ensure that the decisions that are made about what is progressed or what isn't progressed, um, obviously some of that is to do with officers saying what is possible or what is not possible, but there also needs to be some input or check-ins with elected members to ensure that programs that are really actually important to us in our community are prioritised. If it is that, we're not going to deliver on 100% of our capital programme. Um, I have felt... Um, you know, reassured by officers that that thinking is starting and that that work is underway and just even an acknowledgement um, of
collectively understand the impacts and then explain them to the community as to what it is that they are, how they're going to be uh, rated. I know that um, uh, some of you uh, perhaps see the story that we're talking about is purely about uh, a land value, capital value, um, one or the other type scenario that we're considering, but it's more than that really. It's about the overall funding of the council's activities from rates and just quite what the appropriate mix of things is. And you'll be aware, I guess, as uh, part of what you agreed to do in the annual plan, uh, the fixed component of the rates uh, through the Uniform Annual General Charge was reduced uh, quite significantly um, from 500 down to 200, which has a really significant impact then, if you think about it, on what the final um, incidence of rates will be in the future, if you exclude the three waters, uh, the fixed variable component. There'll be a, very, a relatively small fixed component and a very much larger 85%, 86% type uh, portion that's related to the value, which means that in future, if that sort of uh, arrangement continued, the values uh, the, the the rates levels incurred by individual ratepayers would be very susceptible to the valuation changes, much more susceptible to them than what they currently are. So that's something we've got to keep in the back of our minds in terms of thinking about the structure going forward. Um, and there are various ways of uh, covering that off, I suppose. But anyway, in, in terms of what this uh, update is attempting to uh, share with you is the current thinking that we have about timing, as I said, about the things uh, that are, I suppose, what, what is the case for, for considering some review or change and trying to articulate that uh, through uh, 2.3 in the report here. Um, reminding ourselves that rates are a tax in the main, and even more so, I suppose, once the three waters move out of the equation and that we've sort of seen the three waters uh, in the way in which they've funded as being more like a service you can directly attribute to a particular property where there's a connection and you can identify that, whereas more of the, the remainder of the council's activity is uh, more difficult to establish as having a direct connection to a property. Uh, the roads go by, the street lights, the parks and everything are more generic in nature and therefore more likely to be things that um, form part of perhaps a general rate. Um, in terms then of the principles and the objectives for the Council for Rates, I'm not uh, in earlier discussions, you've, um, I, I think, um, embraced still the broad uh, objectives that we have in trying to obtain a rating system. Um, and so for the moment, at least, uh, those objectives would be at the heart of any material that we would prepare uh, because it's just almost an infinite number of variables that you can bring into the discussion in terms of the the way in which we go about um, assessing scenarios and the like. And so um, what this is saying is that you need to have some principles that you're going to grab hold of and say, well, those things give us stakes in the ground to make judgments or to develop scenarios for. Um, in uh, so what I've um, uh, articulated here as best I can in 2.7 is some of the assumptions that we would look to make in developing those scenarios. And my hope is that they reflect your thinking. And so if, if they don't, then it'll be helpful perhaps to get a sense of where they don't um, so that we can move forward with the next phase of developing the scenarios. 
we have, as usual, whenever we bring uh, a, a lot of material together, a need to um, to analyse the, the rating database quite a lot, and we've uh, we're at the point at the moment where we've taken the extracts from our rating database for the 22-23 year. So the aim would be to use the 22-23 year as our underlying comparator that we're comparing things with, uh, but also looking to try to show what the 22-23 rates would be without the three water component, as that in the end will all going to plan be what we're looking to try to compare with once in the new system or change to the system is in place. So um, that um, brings a level of complexity in terms of the way in which we will need to be able to try to think about it and present it to you and present it publicly as well. And so that's exercising our minds quite a lot as to how we uh, might do that. Um, Obviously, in a review process like this as well, um, you will know from the level of interest there was this year through uh, the changes that were made, if you're disturbing the status quo in terms of incidents, that will bring lots of people out of the woodwork who are going to be adversely affected and you perhaps won't hear quite so much from those who, who are going to be benefit from it. But inevitably, if you change the underlying way in which the calculations are done, uh, there will be those who benefit and those who don't. So it's a matter of us through this whole process being uh, able to understand where those um, changes would occur, who would be most impacted, and to be able to articulate that both in this room and publicly as best we can so that um, people can understand that and to recognise that in the end, despite our best ever efforts to do that, there will be lots of people who don't get to see and to hear that message until they get their bill, uh, which is always the case, no matter how, how we go about it. So that then raises the challenge, well, how do we, and in what timeframes, uh, and who with, uh, do we uh, uh, engage with the public? And, um, as a council, we're engaging with the public about a lot of things over a period, and so there's certain things, certain times where it's appropriate to uh, not to mix the messages that are out there and get people confused about what we're working on. And so we've been conscious and thinking about this as well that um, it is difficult. Uh, we would be looking to try to avoid times that we're talking about stuff that's relating to the budget for the 23-24 year, for example, uh, when the council will be having to make decisions about the rates um, for that year and the way uh, and the incidents for that. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we need to progress things. And so there will be touchstone points along the way where uh, we'll need to engage broadly or more specifically with particular groups uh, in the community. And right at this point, uh, you'll see from the report, we haven't developed a specific engagement plan at this point. Um, that's work that's yet to be done uh, amongst the whole team of people here who, who would be handling that. Um, and we will need to work through uh, what we think is the best way of some sort of pre, whether there's pre-engagement involved, whether there's um, uh, scenarios that are developed to engage with the community about and all those sorts of things. So um, uh, the, the timetable, I, I guess, is uh, is tentative at this point in terms of the way we see it, because uh, it, it will involve us, uh, us being us all in this room, uh, deciding on how we want to best engage uh, with each other. Uh, and the types of uh, points at which we need to be able to get direction and help from you about the way forward, uh, where we can start putting some pegs in the ground about things to move uh, move along. 
Um, at the moment, it's assumed here that there would be some sort of a um, an engagement uh, with you as elected members before Christmas this year, um, but we haven't. They haven't been planned specifically yet to, to, to do that. Thank you, Steve. Are you happy to take questions now, or is there I anything? Am. Yes. Thank you, um, Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks, Steve. Um, I just got a few questions. Um, the first one is um, around um, scenarios relating to the transition arrangements. So you've said in your report, you know, you've discussed wanting to transition over three years if there's to be a change. Um, and you've talked about producing scenarios, but would you also look at different scenarios for different transition arrangements? Um, in terms of three years, that that type of uh, situation, it might be. It depends on the nature of what change was proposed as to how significant the amounts were for, uh, and, and therefore the extent to which there would need to be transition. So it seems to me, um, if, if you thought about an outcome, it could be that we had an outcome which had a combination of, of rates being charged by fixed means, by some by the land value and some on the capital value. And if that were the case, the level of change might not be as great. And so it might be something that could be implemented in one year. Uh, if there were other types of changes, there might be much more significant changes and we would look to try and um, determine how best to do that. And uh, so the scenarios, yes, would have options within the transition. OK, so as you develop each scenario, you'll include the transition arrangements in that scenario. Is that what you're saying? Mm. Um, I, I think what we'd be looking to try to do in the beginning was to say, what's the desirable outcome that we're trying to get? And so focus on what's the long term outcome in terms of the nature of the of, of the thing and then and then more focus on the, on how we transition it would be my suggestion about the best way forward otherwise we would perhaps waste quite a lot of time on the transitioning things but not focusing on what we're actually trying to achieve in the end the transition thing in my mind is, is something that would come at the end once it well not necessarily right at the end but would be once we had you'd honed what it is you're trying to achieve in terms of the outcome okay um, in terms of the um, vacant land um, issue, which you've identified in mm. 2.7.2, um, and you've mentioned that Christchurch uses a, a differential surcharge on vacant land, is that something that you'd be including in your scenarios for us to look at? Um. Well, we'll look at a range of issues, I imagine, uh, and certainly if there's a capital value type rate that's applied uh, in the normal course, uh, it, that would mean uh, vacant land would be rated more lowly than what it tends to be under a land value system. Yes, yeah, I understand that. So I'm and, wondering, and is so that going to be included in so your... We, if there was a desire to want to have that rated more highly, we, then we could include some options for how you'd go about that in the so you're looking for that direction today or is that if, if that's it's, yes if you uh, okay. like to have that right thank you um and then in terms of the scenarios um i i take your point that there's an infinite number of variations on the theme um but are you at least looking to model scenarios that are wholly one wholly the other and a mix yes OK, cool. Um, and then my last question is in 2.5.1, when you talk about rating objectives, you say that uh, one of the objectives is uh, that rates are fair and equitable. So what do you understand by fair and equitable? Yes, um, I know that um, when we had a uh, consultant here last year and he talked to me about uh, fair and equitable in the law, it's actually not expressed as that. It's what's appropriate. And so um understanding is so that becomes a value judgment in the end it seems to me there's no right definition of what's fair and equitable uh, so uh describing what you mean by that is pretty hard and i don't have a particular uh, thing in mind uh, but one of the things uh that might 
challenge us in terms of thinking about what's fair and equitable is this ability to pay type um, philosophy. And so uh, if uh, at the moment we don't express uh, ability to pay as one of the things that we consider in thinking about uh, the rating uh, incidents. So if it was, then maybe uh, what's fair and equitable might take into consideration ability to pay, perhaps. Mm. OK, well, that's helpful. So when would you see us being able to input our thoughts on that? Maybe at the first engagement that we have uh, in, a, in a sort of a, I'm not sure when to call it a workshop or a meeting, uh, some sort of meeting in, in the later part of this. Okay, so not now. Not, not right now. Okay, cool. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harpeter. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Steve. Um, looking at the timetable on 2.9 on page 97, appreciate the work that you put into the timetable. Um, know that it probably is quite a fluid process. So um, just um, wanting to have a workshop with councillors in November, December, um, just question probably is, is that going to be kind of like um, possible knowing we're going into a new council? Uh, it's a matter we'll need to discuss um, to see what is possible. Um, if if you rank uh, it really highly as, a, as something that needs to be done, that sometime relatively soon we need to be able to engage uh, about that. And I know that there's a lot of pressure on after the election in terms of the whole timetable of things, and we don't have that workshop specifically in the program at the moment. So it is a matter that we need to, to talk through as to whether it is practical or not. Okay. Second question is around on the next page of the timetable, um, around consultation and hearings and just what you think that looks like in the past. Have you had, um, what, do you, what does it look like? The consultation hearings part, you say? Uh, again, that's something that we need to work through and come back and outline what's proposed in terms of the way in which we'd undertake those things. There's not a, a necessarily a right way of going about it, but we need to develop a plan for that. Um, Is it similar to a hearing process that we've had that we do with normal hearings? Um, well, we 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 have to develop that yet. We haven't. Uh, we 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 can have it form uh, as a formal process or a much more informal process. It depends on the nature of the type of feedback we're getting. But but um, in the end, whatever we propose in terms of the rating system for the 24-25 year will form part of what's in the annual uh, in the 10-year plan consultation material and be the that formal consultation process so if we are engaging publicly in terms of getting feedback before that then it can be a much more informal type of process that we so wouldn't that be a similar timing that we are getting um, information at the same time. Oh, sorry, that's April, May 24. That is when we're talking about yeah. the 10-year the plan consultation. Yeah. So we, have, in terms of whether it's uh, embraced and, and uh, it is part of the uh, standard feedback on the rest of the 10-year plan or whether we look to identify that as something a bit separate, we haven't sorted through that to determine that yet. But at the moment, it looks like a separate part of the consultation process and not part of the 10-year plan process. Uh, it, it, um, that's because we haven't finally determined which is the most appropriate. Uh, it, it will need to form part of the, uh, the decisions about um, the rating system and things are inherent part of what we have to have in our consultation document for the 10-year plan. And so what we get to in terms of a proposal and, and the levels of consultation that we have in advance of that have yet to be, I suppose, fine-tuned to the point that we know what's the best. But at the moment, this is a broad program suggesting that at about the time that the 10-year plan um, consultation is done and the hearings are held, that we would be doing uh, the formal consultation to do with the uh, with the rating system and we haven't yet uh, come to a view as to whether that should 
be best from a practical point of view to be handled as part of it or as something slightly aside from it. Okay, yes. thank you. So there's probably two parts to this. One is um, engagement with the community around the options and scenarios that, that, that elected members do determine to move forward. We may do that earlier because we want to get people's views. Um, but most certainly in terms of the uh, rating system or the rating policy that, that's adopted as part of the 10-year plan, it would come back through that mechanism as well. Because um, obviously when you adopt a 10-year plan, you have to adopt the rating policy moving forward. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, depending on the magnitude of change depends on whether you'd, you'd include some options through that process as well. But there'd probably be a a separate engagement earlier on to get people's views, I would think. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just um, a, a couple of questions from me. And thank you, Steve, for the report. I think um, my first question is about in the assumptions section of 2.7. Um, the one I've got left is about the bullet point. This is rate set on the basis of capital value, expand the rating database to include utilities in the road network. Mm. And you're um, assuming there that those would be rated as commercial industrial. I just want to check if there were other options for that that you'd considered and disregarded or if that's just standard practice when you move to a capital basis. Um, my... I haven't done detailed research on this yet, but my understanding is that most councils would treat those as commercial in the same way as any uh, commercial property in terms of the level of rates. Although I know that there are a few, one or two, uh, I haven't double checked whether they still do it or not, who've got sort of a utility rate of some sort that might be at a slightly different level. But uh, that we would need to look at the um, uh, the implications for those particular um, uh, bills and to see what they ended up being and to whether they were we thought they were appropriate and reasonable or not and whether there was a case for making them uh, to be treated in any way different from the rest. Your working assumption is that there would be commercial industrial? Working assumption would be. But the, the scope for that to yes. be different when you come back with scenarios. Mm, okay, yes. thank you. That That's helpful. Um, and I think my, my only other question I've got left here is we need to follow up that discussion about fair and equitable. Is that... I know you're going to seek our views, you've said that. Um, is that something you expect to seek community views on as well, what they think is a fair and equitable rating system? Um, I guess that's at the heart of what the that would be feeding back to us about, mm. really. Um, uh, if they believe the outcome's unreasonable uh, in whatever form, I suppose fair and equitable could work one way of describing what the, would prompt them to come back if they felt it wasn't. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Or even if they feel it is, that we might get, hopefully get some positive reinforcement about that. <laughs> One can but hope. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Naylor. Um, thanks, Steve. Just a couple of questions. The first one um, is on the UAGC, which we've obviously reduced in this current year to a to adapt to the um, yes. land valuations. Um, would we expect the different modelling um, that's proposed to um, consider whether that should um, increase, go back to what it was or increase or change in any way? Um, my expectation is that we would model a number of levels of uniform charge just to see what uh, effect that had on incidents uh, and that would be shared with you as part of the process. Yep. Okay, thank you. And the second question is relates relates to the objectives 2.5 and the 2.5.2. .2, the comment down there is that the objectives make no reference to ability to pay and ability to pay as a factor that most councils take into account. Um, I guess, do we need to give any direction about that or is that something that we will specifically consult on um, including that or is that a part of determining what is fair and equitable? Yeah. Sorry, I guess it stages through the process. I'd expect that we will look to see whether what we've uh, got as our rating objectives uh, should be changed in their wording just a fraction or not. And as part of that, uh, the stuff we'd come back to you with would make, make suggestions about that and get your feedback. Um, but in broad terms, um, I think 
deep down, uh, most of you and and me included, I guess, would be saying that in bringing forward recommendations or in considering um, what we're suggesting is the most appropriate rating structure that we have in the back of our minds as well, people's ability to pay even now. And um, and so that's, uh, as I said, an unwritten sort of uh, thing that we've got. But if we want to express expressly do that, then I suggest we do that as part of, um, uh, as we evolve what we're talking about uh, going forward. It doesn't necessarily have to be done today, but at some point. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dingwall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my, my questions are, are, are quite similar to um, Councillor Naylor, so I just want to, I guess, clarify a, a couple of things. Um, on page 93, when we talk about most urban councils using um, capital value, I seem to recall um, there was a figure of, I think, I think it was something like 70% of all councils are using um, capital value, and I was just wondering if if there's an update on that, um, if, if I'm correct in that or not. I think you're correct. It's around about that number. Um, in this particular region uh, of New Zealand, there's a greater number that have uh, um, land value as the base than, um, than perhaps in other parts of the country. Uh, I don't, so that the, the New Plymouths, Napiers, Hastings, um, and the like in this sort of mid to lower North Island, all the ones that are still on the land value, but that's not necessarily so. If you go further south, the Invercargles of the world and things have changed to capital. Um, so um, I think you're right, though. I, I don't know exactly the latest at the moment, but it's in that sort of three quarters of the councils, all councils. Uh, and I think all of the regional councils uh, uh, based on capital value, because I think that's the way they were set up originally in the, in the when, when they were first prescribed. And of course, the, the Auckland Council was prescribed to have capital value when it was first established by legislation. And and so with that, um, are you, do you know if there are um, extra, I guess, principles and policies that these councils would have that we wouldn't necessarily have um, I know you 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 mentioned the ability to pay sort of philosophy, um, but do you think that there'd be other work that would need to be done in the policies space? And with that, do you think we are adequately resourced to be able to do that in in this coming period? Um, from my observation, the types of um, I suppose overall principles that drive the rating system are pretty similar around the country. Uh, some might express them slightly differently, but um, uh, people have had, uh, in some areas, have had an attempt at trying to uh, understand uh, where uh, income levels and the like in different parts of their community and then make uh, assessments about where incidents will have. That, that those things uh, can be done. There's going to, a lot of work would need to be required and we're not resourced at the moment to specifically uh, do that sort of work, but we are, I think, resourced to cope with what we expect at the moment to be the style of the way in which we can bring information back to you. Um, okay. Um, and then just finally with the timeline, um, I know that you're saying that, um, I, I mean, <laughs> we can only do what we can do. Um, and so with the timeline there, that's sort of working to to council's schedule. Um, but I was just thinking with the revaluation that ends up happening in uh, 2024, I think you said, um, what are the pros and cons of having a timeline where council makes a decision before that revaluation happens so that when that comes out, people actually understand how that impacts them? I think the difficulty is it's uh, that's going to happen every three years anyway, and so if we are going to consider um, fundamental changes or, or or elements of change to the system, we have to get started at some point, and um, and so we, it's never going to be an ideal time 
But I think if we are, if the council is keen as it seems as it is to review the system and and who knows what sort of outcome in the end you'll decide on collectively as being the most appropriate. But whatever that is, um, we can uh, in transitioning if it involves significant change, uh, take into account the fact that there is a new revaluation schedule at some point in 24, which would ha take effect for the 25, 26 rates, which is quite a long way off yet. Uh, and so I think um, I don't see particularly any problem with um, with considering the sort of timing that we've got here. Mm. Yeah, so um, just, just on that, if we didn't end up, if we went with this timing then, when the revaluation ended up happening, would would council put out comms around sort of this process when that's happening as well? Um, well, my feeling is that uh, under the current timetable, we're we're suggesting that any new uh, changes would take effect in the beginning from one July twenty four. The revaluation uh, is scheduled uh, for mid to late 2024 uh, and wouldn't take effect until the following year after that. So I don't see that that would be a problem in terms of timing. We would be over the hump of uh, having people understanding what the effect of the rates changes would be uh, in August, uh, well, at the latest when they get their bills in August of 24, and then we're into the revaluation and hopefully, uh, who knows what will happen in 2024, but hopefully there, are, there aren't such significant movements in value as what they've been this last couple of times. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Councillor Butt. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Steve. Um, just for my own concept, uh, while discussing the different assumptions for different scenarios, on page 96, you are suggesting that there might be some utilities in the roading network that might come in the network which don't have any land value at the moment. Can you please explain it a little bit? I couldn't understand. Yes. Um, a few years back, the law or the rating legislation changed so that um, things like the uh, water pipes, uh, the sewer pipes, the telecoms infrastructure and the like that's in the, in the road network was considered to be rateable um, property. But because it's in the road and the road is not uh, considered to be uh, rateable itself, the road doesn't have a land value for, for rating purposes, um, there isn't any land value assigned to each of those networks, but there is a capital value that's assigned, which uh, basically represents the level of investment that's in those networks. And so we have a rating unit, if you like, at the moment for each of those networks, the likes of the council's own water network, wastewater network, stormwater, and each of the different other providers that have got networks. And they have, sitting in our rating database, a capital, rateable capital value. And that's updated every year with the changes that are made. So at the moment, um, those, property, th those rating units, which are sort of, an unusual property, but they're a rating unit and are not rated. We don't get any rates from them of any significance. We might charge them a uniform charge, but that's it. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, councillors. That's all the questions um, asked and answered. So thank you very much, Steve. Um, Councillor Johnson, are you happy to move the recommendations? And there's a second one there and seconded by Councillor Naylor. I'll just read the uh, recommendations out. That the proposed approach to progressing the review of the rating system as outlined in the report titled Rating System Review Process Update presented to the Finance and Audit Committee on the 24th of August 2022 be approved. And there's a second recommendation from Councillor Johnson and seconded by Councillor Bowen that scenarios to be developed in the rating system review include the option of a different or of a differential surcharge on vacant land for capital value scenarios. And I'm happy to have comments for both those recommendations. So over to you, Councillor Johnson. 
Thanks, Madam Chair. So um, I'll just speak to the additional one first. Um, it's just to make sure that in the scenarios that staff develop, we include the option of um, a differential rate on vacant land. And the reason for that is that if the decision is taken um, to change from a land value basis to a capital value basis, um, that is potentially a disincentive to develop land if you're if you're holding land, um, because obviously if you've got vacant land, you'd be paying less if there was no building on it. Um, and so we don't we don't want in in potentially making a change. We don't want to actually set back the um, building of housing in the city. And so I think it's important that this be included in the scenario so that we give a clear direction to staff that um, this, I guess you'd see it almost as a bit of a loophole, that this loophole would be covered if we were um, to move to a capital value scenario. So I just wanted to make sure that that was in. Um, but just in general, um, I'm really glad uh, to have this report and to have a timetable of how we might be going about this um, engagement process with the public and how we might develop what we engage on. And um, I do think it is important that we consider a number of scenarios. So it's it will be good to see a 100% capital value scenario, but it would also be good to see that kind of... Um, I don't know, mix and match scenario where you might have capital value um, as a basis, but then some of the uh, fixed, uh, sorry, some of the proportion of the rates will be paid on land value um, because uh, it will be interesting um, to be able to consult on different options. And whilst I have been, um, you know, at the forefront of requesting this um, consultation, over the years. And whilst I do um, think myself at, at the moment, the capital value um, does reflect more someone's abil ability to pay than land value. Um, I think until we get the actual scenarios and we can see, you know, what the modelling shows, um, we can't be 100% sure. And the most important thing to me is that we give people options to look at, you know, in their last you know, which wasn't that long ago, <laughs> the last submissions round um, on the annual budget, you know, we had a lot of people coming to talk to us about how they um, had been adversely affected by the land valuation changes. And when you look at the table in the report, you can see that historically, you know, land value has been a lot more volatile than capital value. And so as land value has made a lot bigger changes in capital value. Consequently, the incidence of rates has changed a lot more for, for our residents because we base ours on, on land value. So I think it's important that we do some modelling to consult with the public so that people can see the different options and they can see the pros and cons of each and we can get a steer for what people want to do. Um, I would be very much in favour of us including explicitly that we consider it ability to pay as one of the principles of the rating system. I think that that will be very important. And I, I actually think in practice it is something we have considered because um, oh, a lot of the debate around the annual budget this year was around people's ability to pay. Um, but I, nevertheless, I think it would be useful to actually have that uh, explicitly in our values. So um, I'm looking forward to us going through this. I don't think we should be um, at all afraid of going out to the public with different scenarios and, um, you know, taking on whatever feedback comes our way. Um, there's no predetermined outcome, uh, certainly not in my mind, and I, and I doubt in anybody else's. Let's just uh, have the conversation and let's make sure that the community feels that we're rating them in a way that is fair and equitable. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Naylor. Thank you, um, and thank you, Steve, for the report. I th I'm really comfortable with what's outlined in this report in terms of the next steps um, and the timeline. I think this is a really essential and important piece of work that we do need to get right. Um, one suggestion I would like to make is that I think it's really important that in the early engagement that we establish the principles, the assumptions and the objectives before we get too far into the detail of modelling um, because human nature is that people will engage, there'll be losers and winners and they may well engage with how that affects them 
rather than establishing those um, high level um, principles for for a start. Um, and just to perhaps elaborate on, on what I'm saying, I, I agree with um, uh, Councillor Johnson in terms of the assumption that we probably around the table have made about the ability to pay being an important part of the equation, but I do agree that we do need to be very specific about that and engage with our community about that. Um, I had a recent conversation with a work colleague um, where she was talking to me about her rates and I'm not very happy about, she wasn't very happy about with them, and I said to her that we were doing a rates review and explained a little bit about what we were looking at. Um, she was very adamant that everyone should pay the same because they get the same services, and, that, and she was adamant about that. She said that's what happens with her power bill, that's what happens with her telephone bill, you know, everyone gets the same services, why is not everyone paying the same amount? And so I think for that reason, we do need to clarify very clearly if um, part of what we consider as being fair and equitable is to include um, an element of someone's ability to pay. We need to engage very early in that concept and establish that explicitly if that is to be a part of the objectives that guide this process. Um, um, yep, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, speaking to the second recommendation first, um, I'm just pleased we've brought that forward specifically. It seemed to me to be um, a gap in that assumptions piece that I think Steve surfaced so well, the assumptions that we've based our thinking on, but this just um, ties that in, and as Councillor Johnson referred to, it's a potential loophole. We certainly don't want to um, start signaling loopholes at, at this stage. Um, in the, the first recommendation, the general recommendation to um, receive this report and go ahead, I'm really pleased to support all of this and totally agree with the comments uh, that Councillor Naylor was just making about um, being really explicit in surfacing those principles, objectives and assumptions at this early stage. I think she's absolutely right. There are, um, that, that's not a shared understanding at this stage. And even when we talk about fair and equitable, that has, I'm sure, 15, 16 different versions around this table, let alone when we go out into the community. Um, and we've all had those conversations about, yeah, we should all play the same because we all get the same service, which speaks to that misunderstanding of what rates actually are, which is a tax, not a payment for services rendered. So if this is something about first principles here and being really clear about not expecting understanding in our community. They all know they pay and they know they'd like to pay less. That's what we can assume. Beyond that, assume nothing, I would suggest, and be really explicit with what we go out with to consult with our community. Thank you. Councillor Denison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. One of the um, concerns I just wanted to express early on, not so much against doing the rating review, I think that's fine, but when we had the revaluations last year, just working off a um, the assumptions that that brought out and the anomalies that um, for similar size lots, let alone without exploring it, um, I would presume the risk of similar size footprints of houses in the same suburb and even in the same street having so much uh, disparity of whether they pay more or actually paid less than what they did the year previously in their rates. And that's hence we had to work so hard to try and address that um, through this last annual plan. And I can't help but think the same exercise would happen again, whether we cast and split and hybrid or whatever else, um, the rating system over the revaluations that just seems to be a, a, a fatally flawed type of basis to do that from. So I just wanted to express that concern. Thank you. Councillor Barrett. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Just to briefly uh, endorse the tenor of the conversation and, and debate so far, I think it's very um, productive direction that it's heading in and look forward to um, the next stages in particular um, I think we experienced through the recent um, annual budget hearings and um, subsequent response, um, the power that sits with us in the levers of the differentials, the power that sits with us in the levers of the uniform annual general charges, and there is actually quite a bit of movement in those graphs as, as we began to exercise some of that, and so I'm particularly heartened um, to um, 
understand that we'll be looking at scenarios that will include, for instance, a range of, of uniform annual general charges so that we can really see um, how the levers that sit within these two broad models actually influence outcomes within um, those um, options that we're going to be looking at. And I think that'll be quite an important part of landing um, an overall package in the end and giving good visibility to the community of the levers as well as the overall systems on the way through is going to be quite um, important to get in good engagement and I think finally good outcomes out of this. Um, but yes, having seen this um, sitting on work schedules and on the cards for some time, it's fantastic to see it here with a timetable moving forward. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Uh, there's no further questions, so Councillor Johnson, do you want to write a reply? Uh, well, I just will briefly just say that I think that our colleagues have made some very good comments. Sorry, colleagues have made some very good comments, um, and I could pretty much agree with all of them, to be honest. Um, and I think um, I'm pleased to see the debate about the rating review, as Councillor Barrett said, um, being productive. Um, I think, you know, that it's always going to be a controversial topic you know, how much we charge people for, for what we supply. But at the same time, I think um, if this sort of a constructive approach and level of, you know, positive engagement around the table continues, then I think it's likely to be quite a successful exercise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is everybody happy if we um, vote on the both recommendations together? OK. So we will now go to vote. And that is carried unanimously. We now move on to item number nine, which is on page 105, and that's the Treasury report, 12 months ending the 30th of June. And Steve, you're up again. Councillors, um, uh, I basically take it as read, except to say that um, uh, there were a few questions a little bit earlier in the uh, quarterly report, the financial report, and Cam responded to some of those, and they uh, uh, addressed one or two issues in relation to to debt and this Treasury activity. It has been a volatile year in financial markets and continues to be volatile. Um, so keeping a, abreast of it and keeping a handle on what's going on and, and getting the right advice is important. Um, the council's debt levels are budgeted to increase uh, significantly over the next little while and including the current year where you've um, passed resolutions enabling significant sums to happen. So it is important that we keep a, a you know, close focus on this. Uh, for the last year, uh, the debt levels, uh, because of the capital program uh, and what we achieved, the, the debt levels ended up being a lot less than what the original budget uh, uh, implied they would be. Um, we made assumptions about the interest expense that we would incur for the year, and it ended up being, um, despite the fact the debt levels were quite a bit lower, um, the interest expense wasn't too much lower than what we budgeted. It was a little bit lower. The average cost of funds for the year ended up being pretty close to the budgetary assumption that we made, which was but good luck <laughs> in a sense. But um, but um, so that was good uh, from my perspective. Uh, part of the reason why the interest expense um, was not so much lower, even despite the fact that the debt levels were so much lower, is that we had assumed that only a third of the interest expense for any new debt would be incurred in that first year. So a, a relatively small proportion of the interest expense had actually been provided for. So. Um, uh, I think in the end, we've uh, positioned ourselves as best we can. We've ended up, I think, um, achieving well within our expectations in terms of the cost of debt and the um, 
and what we'd done to fix the appropriate levels. As I've mentioned to you before, uh, uh, looking forward, it is um, a day-to-day -day issue where we continue to manage uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, I, I have regular uh, monthly meetings with our advisors about this, and the most recent of those was yesterday. Um, and so since the 30th of June, we have raised another 15 million of new debt, 5 million of which was on lent to the airport company because we've taken that uh, uh, on board as raising money for them. Um, and we have had 5 million of our debt that matured and we repaid that using some money that we'd borrowed in advance uh, to enable us to be sure that we had the capacity to do that. So uh, looking forward, we have uh, not until uh, April next year, uh, a further amount of debt, 20 million maturing, and we have the funds on hand to cope with uh, repaying that at that time. Uh, the trickiest thing that we've got, well, I, I, there are two, two tricky things, I think, uh, from my perspective in managing the debt and taking appropriate action uh, going forward. The first of those is in relation to the three waters and what assumptions we make about debt for that. Uh, and just as an aside in relation to that, uh, the DIA team that are uh, involved in the transition for the three waters uh, plan to come to us uh, in shortly uh, in September uh, with uh, an intention to understand uh, more specifically our debt at the 30th of June, just as we've reported it here, and what proportion of that we believe relates to the Three Waters activities. Uh, and their intention is to want to reach agreement about that this calendar year so that uh, whatever happens between now and the two years' time can, can be worked through. But um, the actual debt itself is, is um, should be not too difficult to, to work up a, a um, uh, an understanding of what but we would believe relate, relates to the three waters, but are much more difficult um, to actually determine what proportion of our swap portfolio relates to those and whether uh, and, and just quite what the crown negotiators are going to come in terms of their basic understanding of how they go about that will be interesting to see in the beginning and uh, I'm planning to work with our advisors to make sure that we position ourselves as best we can to do that so Thank you, that's Steve. position from my perspective. So you're open for questions now? Yes. Uh, Mr Armstrong. Thank you Madam Chair, thank you Steve. Look um, you've I think partially addressed my question, which was exactly around what does our balance sheet look like? What's our future borrowing capacity going to be post um, the three waters assets leaving our balance sheet? So what I take is it's a... I'm sorry, Mr Armstrong, can you just move your mic? What I take is it's currently a work in progress, but I am interested in how you're planning to factor that into the next 10-year annual plan. Um, obviously, our capacity to borrow is an important lever in moderating or transitioning arrangements and, and how we pay for services. So just what are you thinking? When will we have a better feel? As part of the development of the present 10-year plan, we produced scenarios uh, which we shared publicly and with the audit team and the like, it, it is showing what we thought our provisional understanding would be of our scenario of the position without the three waters and what our debt capacity was. And at that point, that's why we uh, said that we thought uh, within the framework that currently exists, Without the three waters, then the council, uh, based on the numbers that were in the 10-year plan, could uh, would be close to some of its limits still, uh, and there would need to be some prioritisation, but it was manageable in terms of a way forward relative to what the balance sheet was saying. 
So uh, what we've committed to, though, as the council and in terms of our funders is to review that position again once we know for sure what uh, the direction of travel is in relation to the three waters. Um, and it's uh, so we, we're keeping a watching uh, brief on that and we're keeping informing ourselves and, and doing further investigative work to position ourselves to be in for that. But but it is a fundamental assumption for the 10 year plan about uh, just what the asset levels are, what the debt levels are, uh, what our expected expenditure on those non water activities is so that we could Okay. Give advice about that and through the development of that. Okay, so appreciate that's work in progress. Um, where where does standard and pause sit in terms of credit rating? Yes, that they uh, have a continual review of local government generally, in in um, and well, the government because they they're doing both really, and, and they've got uh, uh, analysts who are keeping a really close watch on this. They have. They are also involved in helping assess through um, the local government funding agency because they assess them as well. Um, and so they, I know that they're closely involved in the negotiations looking forward as to what how the water entities would be funded and therefore what impact there might be on uh, the local government funding agency and on councils as well. So for the moment, um, they still believe there's a strong picture uh, of, for local government beyond three waters, but that's an annual review. If you well, that they in, in a global sense continually investigating that, and sometimes put out papers about it. But in particular, for our council, the next annual review is scheduled for April next year, and at that point, uh, we'll be having to put to them what our latest position is and what our forecasts are and where we see the position and they will well it'll just depend on what's happened at that point as to how it's seen okay thank you thanks steve thank you madam chair uh councillor nana thank you thanks steve um you started saying that there were two tricky things the first being the three waters what was the second tricky second thing? things really the um well i suppose there are actually three things the the, the interest rates and what's happening to them uh, and the next thing really is um, the financial markets and, and um, what uh, level of interest there is in investing in local government bonds. And that's something that the local government funding agency is continually looking at on our behalf uh, in conjunction with all of the other councils. But uh, at times, depending upon what's happening worldwide in these markets, there's greater or lesser interests in bidding for council's bonds. And, and there have been one or two tenders recently where they have had not nearly as good a um, uptake, if you like, in terms of cover uh, for what they've been seeking. So we can't take for absolute granted that there'll always be people who wish to invest <laughs> in these things, but our agents, as I mean, the local government funding agency are the experts in this field and they have positioned themselves to try to make sure that they're able to cope with providing the funding that local government needs when we need it. Yeah, thank you. I thought it was probably interest rates, but I um, thought I'd better check. Um, just looking at page 108 in the bullet point, third one up from the bottom, where you talk about the 30%, um, the forecast debt, and reduce it by 30% each year. Um, I mentioned earlier in the meeting about the two pictures that we're getting given by officers. Some officers are saying they're confident that they can deliver on 100% of the capital program. Other other reports indicate this 70% yes. delivery that we're basing our modelling on. So what would happen if we were to deliver more than 70% of our capital program year on year for a number of years? Oh, as Cam mentioned, I think uh, a little bit earlier in the meeting, um, we are continually reviewing this assumption in terms of a forecasting assumption for the uh, for risk management in terms of interest. And for the moment, uh, we haven't changed the assumption that we've used for the last two or three years, which is that thirty percent. Once we, if we start to see evidence in the um, in the reports that we are seeing and that you're getting to see about the delivery. Uh, ramping up and being able to accomplish what our staff believe that they've got in, in the happening, 
uh, then we will review and perhaps raise that and if necessary take uh, action but for the moment particularly because of the uncertainties of the three waters and the need to be able to extract ourselves from some of those swap uh, things going forward if we need to then uh, we're erring on the conservative side in terms of the level of fixing that we've got. Okay, thank you. And just my second question relates to page 115 and the graphs there that have the forecast debt level um, at, and that top one in particular, um, it has the forecast debt level at three, uh, seven, 700 million and that's with the 30% hedging. Um, in our long-term plan, I th think that our debt level was more projected to be about 880 million. Do we not do the hedging in our modelling for the long-term plan? Uh, in the ten year plan in the ten year plan, we've got the forecasts uh, that that you rightly say have the uh, translate from what our capital program is and what the required borrowing is. We also know that the ten year plan was not fundable in the form in which we had it, uh, but we uh, your your decision was to adopt that and to take the course that we've taken. Now, um, what this is saying in terms of this particular interest rate risk is that we've I've taken the figures that were in the 10-year plan, reduced them by the 30% haircut, and that's what the line would look like with that haircut. Um, and so, uh, and therefore, that is driving the ex some of the decisions about how much uh, we take in terms of swaps. And so, uh, it's it's difficult because of that impact of that water and wastewater activity in particular. That's why we've got that other one, which is showing without the waters, uh, what the position would be. Thank you. If I could just add to that. Um, when we manage interest rate risk, so, so there's two parts. One is you go through your annual budget exercise and long-term plan exercise where we budget for debt in, uh, um, in, in terms of what's required. We budget for that in full. But when we manage interest rate risk, we don't. Uh, we want to make sure that we are, are more active in terms of how we manage that. We don't put ourselves in a position where we have too much fixing or hedging in place, because when you do, uh, when that does occur, um, and particularly when you've got the three waters ahead of us, you could end up in a position where you have more swaps than you have debt, and that that's not prudent. So, so we want to manage it as things happen um, based on. Um, based on all the environmental factors around us, it's it's much better to operate and manage that function that way than be the op opposite way and be overzealous with hedging. Okay, thank you. I think, so what I'm hearing, am I correct in understanding that the long-term plan projections don't include the hedging? But the, uh, the, uh, When you say they don't include the hedging... Well, Sorry, the 30% um, reduction of... Uh, the 10-year the plan includes the whole cost, the, the, what, the, what the debt would be if it was all raised. What we're, doing, what we're saying here is that we've deducted, we've taken 30% off those 10-year yep. plan figures okay. and used that for the purposes of this interest rate risk management. Okay. In terms of our finance, uh, you know, is it problematic that we've got two different um, debt level forecasts, that there's not alignment between our LTP figures and these figures? Um, I think what we're having to make is judgment calls here about what's the most prudent thing for the council to do. And there's no right answer about this, really. What we're saying is that our judgment is that um, in terms of the, we have a policy setting, which we've agreed through the treasury policies as to what proportion of the council's debt should be fixed. And that is based on our projections over the 10 years of what the debt will be. So when there's uncertainty about what the level of the debt will be, we're then having to put some stakes in the ground and say, well, what do we, what are we going to use as our planning assumptions? And that's what we're doing here. We're making planning assumptions. Uh, we think for the moment that they're reasonable, uh, but by the, because of the three waters coming, we're also testing them against a scenario without the three waters involved, just to see what that would look like. And we're trying to manage, if you like, into, uh, between those two scenarios, two outcomes, 
to, to make sure that when we look forward that we can that we can plan a path through there. Perhaps if I could just add as well, it, it is it was reasonably common practice as well uh, in terms of my knowledge of managing treasury functions in local government that that it's managed on a more conservative basis for interest rate hedging. Madam Chair, just one quick tiny thing I mentioned since that I'm open at that page. On page 114, I noticed last night I've got a thing at the top of the page which says to be updated. Well, in fact, the graph is the updated graph, and I forgot to remove that uh, comment that I've got sitting there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's no further questions, so thank you, Steve. You may step down. Um, I'm happy to move the recommendation and I'll just read it. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Um, the committee resolved to note the performance of Council's Treasury activity for the 12, month end, 12 months ending the 30th of June 2022. And I think, the, as Steve said, the two key things that we've got to watch for in the future we're at risk is the interest rates. And who thought we'd be looking at, you know, five or six percent this week when a year ago we were at one and two and three. So it just goes to show you how a year changes. And also the three waters, whether it goes ahead or not, is going to impact. So that's something that we're going to have to obviously manage very closely. So it's good to see that we've got um, good financial prudence around our um, finances. So thank you, Steve. And Cam and the team. Um, are there any further comments? There being none, we'll go to vote. And that is carried unanimously. We now move on to item number 10, which is the Assurance Report Asset Management Review, and that's on page 117. And we have um, Suma, the Business Assurance Manager, and Helen, our Asset Management Planning Manager. So over to you two. Afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Um, this is a review that was triggered by the formal business assurance program that was approved here in December last year. Now, I will take majority of the report as read. We might just make a couple of comments before we take any questions through you, Madam Chair. Um, in 2019, a similar maturity assessment was undertaken, and at the time we received a rating of 51. Um, this time round, they've given us a rating of 60. So in numbers, it does seem like it's a small number of an increase of nine. But if you talk to the assessors that came in, they were actually quite happy with the progress we've made. They see that's you know still a quite a significant jump for the amount of work that we have done. Things that they did praise included the develop the establishment of the asset management division because three years ago we didn't have that. Now we do, so they did like that dedication. They liked the fact that we have regular reports coming up to elected members, so that support they were very appreciative of. Um, they, there was one more thing that was in my mind. Um, oh, uh, also some support functions that we now have in place. So risk, procurement, they didn't really exist at the time either. Now we do have those. They are still maturing. So of course that has been reflected in the report. There is still scope for improvement. We are still working towards the rating of 80, which is our target. Um, we don't have a action plan yet, but as you can imagine, there's a lot of work that we need to now go ahead and scope out. And that's what Helen's team will be working on. And I will pass on to Helen before we take any questions. I'll just take it as read as well. Um, suffice to say that the maturity bands go up in bands of 20. So nine is actually half a maturity band. So we were quite pleased with that. Um, and as Masuma has indicated, it has been quite an all of council effort with procurement and risk um, contributing quite a bit to the increase as well as all of infrastructure. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have um, a couple of questions. Um, around the asset management process management, that score only went up to 
from 40 to 42. And there's comments that the processes are genuinely, genu generally not well documented. Um, would you like to just further comment on that and what plans are in place, you know, future plans maybe to increase that? In general, when maybe you're a little bit understaffed, mapping of process and writing down how you do it tends to be one of the things that, that does suffer. Um, but we have started on that. Um, we've made some quite significant gains in documenting how we do valuations and um, how we do a lot of the sort of work around the value of the assets. Um, we've also engaged, our group is also engaged with a business analyst and basically it's her job as well, you know, with us to, to help us with that sort of writing down process for our group and across infrastructure. Okay, so... Um so my experience with this, so you, and there's other comments in there, is that you then start relying on senior staff that have been here a long time around those processes. And in the environment we were in where we could lose staff, aren't we putting ourselves at risk by not having these um, processes documented? Um, Yes, there is, that risk exists, and that's one of the reasons why we've got someone in to give us a bit of a hand get some of this, to get some of this stuff over the line. Um, we've recognised that, that is a risk that we want to reduce. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Armstrong. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you for your report. Um, my question was a pretty simple one, really. Um, it's great progress, but still a long way to go. So... How how could we take a massive leap forward? What are the options around improving more quickly? To be fair, the nine point jump is is it quite a jump um, in terms of uh, the ability of uh, speed of organisations to move forward in in this area. That's why they were quite surprised. Um, we have, I think, dealt with a lot of the low hanging fruit. Um, so further jumps of such a magnitude mo are going to be um, more difficult, I guess. Um, I think that some of the plans we've got in place in terms of some of the things that are going on already in terms of the design panel, things like that, will help us to um, move forward. I'm not sure of massive jumps, and Cathy might like to add something. She does some of these audits for other organisations. Um, thank you, um, Councillors. Cathy Diva Todd, Acting Chief Infrastructure Officer. Uh, so my specialisation is um, asset management, and I've done a lot of these maturity assessments for government agencies, local government, and for um, for the particular tertiary sector, um, at using the same methodology. So my experience is that um, what tends to happen in these uh, reviews is people focus on their data and their systems, and they get very caught down in the weeds. What's happened in this organisation is they have lifted the lower performing areas, so the average score overall has increased. Now, that reduces your risk profile. My experience working with agencies is you get a relatively big gain at the beginning, normally about five or six points. So nine points is is, is a good increase. Um, going further forward, we need to bear in mind not just the increase, but the target we're aiming at. So we're aiming at a target here of 80 um, top of intermediate, which is appropriate for the organisation. So we're at 60, so we're closing in that gap pretty, pretty um, quickly. We don't want to be aiming for um, something that's beyond what we need for managing the organisation. What um, I guess is really important is to understand that asset management is an end-to-end -end business process and it involves a number of aspects of the business, including procurement, contract management, financial management, risk management. So to get a further lift, all of those processes across the organisation have to be maturing as well. There's been quite a lift in the risk management space because the organisation has been maturing in risk management. Um, things like the new enterprise-wide system where we're business process mapping all our processes will help us in, uh, um, in asset management and some of that um, embedding what people do every day. So to, so to, to close it further, the, um, the increase will slow down over time because the whole organisation 
needs to mature in a number of business processes. But I am confident that the process that has been made at the moment um, is reaching across the organisation, and it's an organisational-wide change, as opposed to just one unit or one division of the council maturing. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. So um, the, uh, the ERP is obviously pretty important. I wondered also, are there opportunities for us to leverage your best practice in other councils? How are we thinking about that? Um, so, uh, again, just remind you, we don't want to go to best practice, we want to go to in appropriate practice, absolutely. So we've been doing that, working with some of the individual consultants we've been bringing in and levering off that. Um, obviously, I have a good knowledge of a lot of that best practice because I'm working in that. Um, so I'm currently the chair of the National Asset Management Support Group. So um, what's happening around New Zealand, the best practices coming into this organisation. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Councillor Naila. Thank you. Um, I have um, two areas of questions and they relate to the two bullet points on page 125, the second bullet point and the third bullet point. Um, the first one, the capital works planning, it talks about the prioritisation approach that's varied and basically, you know, needs improvement. In terms of, is this talking about the prioritisation approach to determine what's in annual budgets or the long-term plan, or is it talking about the prioritisation approach of the delivery of those programmes within a year? It's talking about the LTP and the annual plan approach. Okay. Is there any thinking about, is there any prioritisation of the way that um, the Capital Works programme is delivered within an, a year? Or is that a part of this in any way? Um, it hasn't been, and I think possibly that's been already covered in the meeting. Co covered by by what? Just I, I'm not sure. Has it not been discussed? No, it's not part of this anyway. Sorry, okay. I missed what you were saying. I was right. The okay, that's fine. That answers my question. Um, okay, so the prioritisation approach, um, the actions that will be scoped by Helen, by yourself. Um, will there be any input from elected members in regards to that? Sure, I'd say yes. Great, <laughs> thank you. And just the second area is the next one down, the asset manage, uh, asset financial planning and management. Um, it talks about council's um, approach of three-year renewal forecast rather than the long-term depreciation, which it says most other councils in New Zealand do. Um, is, has there been any consideration of the advantages or disadvantages of either model and why is it or, or why is it that we are do we do a take a different approach perhaps to what most other councils do in regards to that do you want to talk to that Cameron sorry I, I can attempt to give you a comment on that as someone who's now worked with two different approaches I've come from a, a background of and a specialty in depreciation funding in particular. Um, the, I don't think there's a particularly right or wrong answer. Uh, the, there is a difficulty for councils who have historically not funded depreciation to suddenly move to that model. And, and you'd have to, uh, that would have to be a transition over time if that was a decision to be made. Larger councils in particular, um, do tend to uh, do tend to fund renewals or a rolling renewal forecast because they simply have a larger ongoing program of renewal work and they have the rate power base to do that. Uh, particularly the smaller councils, to have any sort of spike in, in renewals in any given year, they don't have the ability to to uh, to spread that funding. So that's why they made quite an early decision to fund depreciation, and many of them two decades ago. There's nothing to say that you can't move to that model, but it will take time and you'd have to weigh up the pros and cons and factor in the the size of the rating base that we have here to be able to spread renewals across. Okay, just sorry, qu quickly further to that. So is it, am I correct to assume that the long-term depreciation model would be more expensive for ratepayers than the, the, the three-year rolling renewal? It would. Uh, it's a complex area. Um, uh, the councils that fund depreciation, not all, they don't all fund 100% of depreciation in any given year. So 
So even those that do fund depreciation, they make decisions during the long-term plan about the appropriate level of depreciation to fund, factoring in any external funding they may receive, and taking into account what the long-term asset renewal profile is and smoothing that across. So, so from a practical point of view, um, they would look at 30 to 50 years ahead and go, well, are we, if we're funding at 80% of depreciation, is that appropriate? So that, that's how they do it. They don't necessarily say we're going to fund dollar for dollar of depreciation. Okay, thank you. Councillor Vera. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, Masuma. Thanks, Helen, for um, your work in preparing this report. Just um, two questions. Um, the first one, Helen, relates to your memo of 26 July, um, and that translates into pages 142 and 143 on the on the current agenda. I was trying, Helen, to understand the, the table under 5.1 in contrast to the table under 5.3 um, <clears throat> in that it seems like a number of um, activities are are being progressed in 5.1 and, and the numbers are quite a lot lower um, when we get to 5.3. Can you tell us what's happened to the balance there? Thank you, pardon. Um, the ones that we've put in this table in 5.3 are the ones that I guess are more further progressed than the, um, so we, we've we started in some way 40, as you can see on the first table, but we've only, um, the ones in the second table are ones that are further progressed and we're actually able to say um, what we've, um, what we're going to do with them by the end of the year or the end of um, August. Well, thank you. So as I'm reading 5.3, that kind of takes us through to um, through the 10 year plan process coming. Um, I guess to me, it seems that that's quite a drop from, you know, 40 programs kind of um, being actively pursued down to these kind of single digit numbers. Are we sufficiently I guess probably the first question is kind of what risks and challenges are we exposing ourselves to by not progressing those other programs? We are progressing those other programs. It's just that one of them are not going to be um, finished by the end of the year. Most most of the programs will end up being reprioritised as we revise the improvement plan. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so my other question then is really around, are we sufficiently resourced in terms of capability and capacity in the asset management space? Um, with the restructure that happened in infrastructure uh, in late last year, early this year, we're moving to a space where we will be well, um, will be well resourced within our group. Um, we can always, you know, it will be resourced appropriately, I should say, within the asset management division, also in the wider infrastructure unit, because we are relying quite a lot on the wider infrastructure unit working with us to support some of these programs. Um, some of that is the um, the resourcing there is is moving to an appropriate place where we will be able to move things forward. Thank you. Madam Chair. Right. Uh, there's no further questions, so you may step down, ladies. And we will now move to the recommendation. Happy to move it, Deputy Mayor, and seconded by C Councillor Naylor. And I'll just read the um, recommendation. The committee resolved to receive the me memorandum titled Assurance Report Asset Management Review and its attachments presented to the Finance and Audit Committee on the 21st, 24th of August 2022. Do you want to speak to that, Deputy Mayor? Oh, that's right. I'll just make one or two comments. Oh, you can go first, Councillor Nola. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the report. Um, that's a huge piece of work, um, and it's really good to see that step up. 
um, from 51 to 60. And obviously there's there's some um, further scope for us to make some further improvements. And I look forward to the actions that are um, determined to, to help us progress along that process. But thanks to the officers for the work that's being done. Uh, yes, and I agree with that. Um, I just would like to comment that um, I do get a little bit concerned when I see a couple of times in the report that we are re relying on experienced staff. And I know also the, um, you know, the movement and staff, you know, that puts us at risk. And it also puts pressure on those experienced staff because I know what it's like to be one of those. So you just got to, um, yeah, just um, be careful with that. And I'd just like to comment that I'm pleased to see the areas like the capital works planning and property and the outsourcing and procurement. And I'm pleased to see that they've significantly gone up in um, scores. So well done on that. So um, thank you for that and the time that you guys have put into this report. So we'll now go to vote. And that is carried unanimously. Have four minutes before we go to lunch, so I'm going to fit the work schedule in. So we'll move to um, page 173. And I'm happy to move the work schedule. If I have a seconder, thank you, Councillor Butt. And are there any comments around the work schedule, Councillor Naylor? Um, thanks. Just the um, two items, the procurement procurement and the delegations that are coming to this um, report, this this meeting, um, both of those have some follow-on steps, some further steps for those um, decisions to come back. So I'm just wondering if those can be um, included. I think there's comments in there that, that they'll be included in the six monthly reporting, but I just want to make sure that that's captured. Yep, that's noted. Thank you. Mr Armstrong. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My question has been addressed. Okay, that's great. So we will now go to vote. And that is carried unanimously. So we'll now break for lunch and we will come back at one o'clock. Uh, sorry, two o'clock. I was yeah, I was going to be a quick lunch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. For those of you that are lunching, it's Robert Harris. <laughs>